This is Dr. Lauren Lownan, continuing in the lecture series addressing making sense of genomic data, gene calling, and genome annotation. So we just looked at human chromosome 1 at the UCSC genome browser, and um, hopefully that example shows you some of the wealth of information that you can have in a fully finished genome, which means a genome that has been fully annotated. And that's kind of the end goal, and we're looking at an earlier step in that and thinking about how you get to that end goal. So to annotate for, means literally means to supply with critical or explanatory notes, comment upon in notes, and that's a definition from dictionary.com. And in the context of genomics, to annotate means to identify and label specific important regions of genomes, for example, genes. And annotation fits into the overall process of genome project work or assembling and finishing a genome and then sharing that information with the general public. So first you get DNA sequence and then you assemble that DNA sequence and then you call the genes. And this green line is sort of showing various steps involved or that can be involved in calling the genes. The first step is to use computer-based gene prediction, and part of that is to do something called ORF finding, which we're going to be talking about in this lecture series. You can apply other information to that, such as genetic data obtained from cytological data or crossing or recombination frequencies. That's done a lot in eukaryotes. You can take gene sequences that you identify with the computer and you can look for similar or homologous sequences in online databases. And you can also, not shown here, is just applying biological information um, that experts have to the genes that you're studying. Like, does it make sense that you would have that gene in that particular organism, for example? And that's how you get an annotated genome um, and the construction of a database based on that genome. And that's at the point at which you should release it to the public. Um, and then once it's been released, you'll continue to study it and to acquire new information. And there'll be kind of this feedback loop or this process that continues as you get to understand the organism better and better. So overall, genome annotation is a multi-step process, and it involves both bioinformatics and wet lab experimental work because a lot of this genetic data you might obtain in the wet lab. It's a necessary step in moving from a draft sequence or draft genome to a finished genome, one that's been better understood and is more useful to scientists. And we're going to focus in this lesson, in this series of lectures, on computer-based gene prediction. So we're trying to figure out how you go from this long set of sequence information to knowing this is a gene and knowing and labeling that gene, like what is it, annotating it. So in order to do that, you have to know a set of background information. So for example, you need to know the basics of gene structure in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So let's consider again what a gene is. So I gave you a couple of definitions for genes in an earlier lecture. Let's use this one here, a sequence of DNA that encodes the genetic information for one or more related polypeptides or, or proteins or functional RNA molecules. A functional RNA molecule might be a tRNA or an rRNA, along with the regulatory sequences required for its transcription. So I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but it's really important that we embrace complexity as we move into this like somewhat complex field. So here's a sequence of DNA shown in red, and we know that DNA in cells is double-stranded, and so for this sequence, there would also be a complementary and anti-parallel sequence. In other words, there would be a second strand of DNA that's not shown here. It would be 5' prime on this side and 3' prime on this side. Where there was a G, there would be a C. C would be G, G would be C, T would be A, T would be A, and so on, following the complementary base pairing rules. And that's how the chromosome itself would exist. What's shown here is one of the two strands, and it is the strand that is being used as the template in order to produce a messenger RNA molecule shown in yellow. That template is also interpreted using base pairing rules, the same base pairing rules that hold two strands of DNA together, except that there are no T's in RNA, so we replace them with U's. The messenger RNA transcript is then used to produce a protein 
Short form for our protein is polypeptide. It's a sequence of amino acids, arginine, aspartame, and leucine. So this is the process of translation. So this is the flow of genetic information or gene expression. And that protein is what gives rise to a phenotype. In this mouse, it's the phenotype of dark coats. This is just part of the protein. So how do you find genes within genome sequence? Let's consider that. So let's first think about the difference in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. These are the two different cell types that exist in nature. So while gene expression, as I just showed you a moment ago, is essentially identical in these two groups of organisms from the basic perspective, in other words, they use codons to represent an amino acid, the base pairing rules are constants, and so on, there are some differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryotes have one single circular chromosome. They're haploid in nature. Eukaryotes have um, two linear chromosomes that exist in pairs. They have multiple pairs. In some cases, for example, humans have 23. And um, that's a basic difference in the genomes of these organisms. So prokaryotes are essentially always haploid. Eukaryotes are diploid unless you're looking at the cell, uh, at the sex cells. Another difference is that the timing of transcription and translation are different. So there's no nucleus in a prokaryotic cell, which means transcription and translation occur at essentially the same time and place in the cell. This is different than in eukaryotes. In eukaryotes, transcription happens in the nucleus, this purple ball here, and then the RNA is processed and exported and outside of the nucleus, where the ribosomes are located, that's where translation occurs. So there's some differences in how RNA is handled in eukaryotes relative to prokaryotes. Gene structure is also different. So importantly, prokaryotic genes are much shorter and simpler. Prokaryotic genes have no introns or exons. Most of the sequence in a prokaryotic gene, except for on the ends, is coding. Eukaryotic genes, in contrast, are much longer. They have introns and they have exons. The exons are the coding regions, the regions responsible for making amino acids, or for choosing the amino acids to make proteins. Introns are the spaces in between them. And there are what are called splice sites, bounding introns and exons. So what's the same between prokaryotic and eukaryotic genes? They both have coding sequences or sequences that give rise to a sequence of amino acids once translation has occurred. They have start and stop codons, and they have regions on the ends of genes called the 3' prime and the 5' prime untranslated regions. They also have promoter sequences to begin or to allow the beginning of transcription. Here's a gene structure for a prokaryotic organism. And remember, prokaryotes include the bacteria and the archaea. So here is the coding region shown in blue. That's going to be organized into sequences of three nucleotides, each representing a particular amino acid. And you can look at the codon table or a codon table to know which sequences go with which amino acids. On the left, there's a start codon, ATG usually. At the far end, there's one of three possible stop codons shown here. Bracketing the coding region is a transcription start site. And there's going to be a promoter region in here, which is where RNA polymerase binds in order to ensure that uh, transcription starts at the correct area. The start and the stop codons are only going to play a role in translation. Down here, we've got an area called the 3' prime untranslated region. And then what we will have like a signal that stops transcription built in somewhere here. There are no introns in these genes within prokaryotic genes. As a further note, many prokaryotic genes are found in structures that are called operons. So in operons, you have a promoter region, often a regulatory site on either side. And then you have a set of genes. And all of those genes are controlled by the same promoter. So the definition for an operon is a set of genes all controlled by the same promoter. RNA polymerase binds here once, and then it transcribes all of these genes in sequence. An example of a prokaryotic operon is the LAC operon that some of you will be familiar with. Eukaryotic gene structure is a lot more complicated. 
So in eukaryotic gene structure, you have promoters, but they're a lot more variable. They serve the same function as in prokaryotic uh, cells in that, or prokaryotic genes in that promoters serve to bind RNA polymerase. You still have five prime um, and three prime untranslated regions, and you have start and stop codons bounding the coding sequence, but the coding sequence is broken up into exons, which are actually coding, and introns, which are non-coding. And so what happens when a eukaryotic gene is transcribed is it's transcribed and it produces a raw RNA transcript and then some modification of that transcript occurs and part of that modification is to remove the intron areas making a final mature transcript or messenger RNA and that is what is translated. So the, the complexity of eukaryotic genes is much greater than the complexity of prokaryotic genes. So in this class, we're going to focus on prokaryotic genes. And in this section of the class, we're going to focus on prokaryotic gene calling or ORF finding. And why are we going to do that? Because it's a good place to start when you're learning genomics and you're learning molecular biology for several reasons. First, prokaryotic genes are smaller and their genomes are smaller. So eukaryotic genomes are range from 10 mega or million base pairs in size to almost 700 billion base pairs. We see those sorts of genomes in some uh, complex plants. Whereas prokaryotic genomes are only about a half to 10 mega base pairs in size. Similarly, the genes uh, for prokaryotes are smaller. On average, they're about a thousand base pairs or one kilo base pairs long whereas eukaryotic genes can be many, many thousands, even hundreds of thousands of base pairs long. Secondly, the gene structure is simpler in prokaryotes because they have no introns. And third, um, it's kind of a, looking for a needle in a smaller haystack to work with prokaryotic genes. Eukaryotic genomes are about 1% coding because of introns, and also eukaryotic genomes have a lot of what's called repetitive or non-coding DNA whereas prokaryotic genomes are about 90% coding. So they're much more efficient, and they're simpler and smaller in structure, which makes them um, easier to study, easier to understand, and a really much better starting place for somebody that's new to genomics. So with that, I'd like you to move on to the next uh, lecture segment in this lecture series.